Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me Rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anae Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you will have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Hey Vet Rehabbers, now February is our birthday month, but today the 7th of Feb is our actual birth date. It's the date the first official webinar of the Online Pet Health membership was aired. The topic was the canine shoulder and it was lectured by David Levine. And this lecture is still available in the membership. So in the true spirit of birthdays, we would love to gift you, the Vet Rehabber community, two free webinars this month. For our non-members, you can go to onlinepetalt.com forward slash gift to access them. And for our members, you will go into the membership. These will be added as a bonus. So the webinars are the Grayston Technique. This is an instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization that uses a medical grade stainless steel instrument. And basically what it does is amplifies the feeling of palpation and expands the power of your hands as you work to identify any soft tissue irregularities in the body. And um, this technique is going to be lectured mainly on horses and it is sponsored by Grayston Technique. So thank you for that sponsorship. Our second webinar is sponsored by Canine Rehab Institute and is lectured by their very own, Cara Amstead. This is a great refresher. It's radiology tips for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. So you can sign up at onlinepetalf.com forward slash gift. Today, I chat to Andrew Armitage. He's no stranger to the Veterinary Rehabilitation Podcast. Andrew and I talk about common causes of idiopsoas strains, how they're diagnosed, how they're traditionally treated, and how he is treating them using regenerative medicine. Initially, before he started using regenerative medicine in these cases, he used to see a really high recurrence rate, and now his recurrence rate has drastically dropped. You guys are going to find this really, really interesting. Over to Andrew. Hey, Andrew, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me back and uh, to speak about some ileosoas problems today. Yeah, I think this is the third time you've been on the podcast now. So very, very excited to have you back. And this is a great topic we're going to chat about um, because I think, you know, it's a topic that often gets undiagnosed. I think it it is becoming sort of more common um, for vet rehabbers, yeah. I think. Vet rehab yeah. therapists are more aware of it but it's a it's it's a condition that you have so strange that I think that a lot of vets are not 100% aware of. And, you know, even when I think back to vet school, I don't even think we learned about it, you know, at vet school. I, mean, I qualified in 2001. It doesn't ring a bell to me. Did you learn about it? No, I mean, I qualified in 2002 and uh, I was never taught about the ileosoas. Didn't, uh, wasn't aware of its existence. <laughs> yeah, and I think back... Now, actually, even in my very early days of vet rehab, so I'm talking probably like 2006, 2007, 2008, probably in 2008, that's when I slowly started to become aware of it. And I think it was because I went to a conference and somebody spoke about it. And I was like, oh. And, um, you know, once you're aware, then you start thinking back to those cases that yeah. you had that you were treating, you know, that had you know, cranial cruciate ligament ruptures or hip problems, and they just were not coming right. And you were just like, why? Like, what am I doing wrong here? And those ones, you know, once I knew about it, I was like, oh, that dog probably had an iliopsoas strain, which I didn't diagnose that I missed. Yeah, I was exactly in the same boat. Uh, it was when I did my CCRP course that uh, I became more aware of the iliopsoas. And then once you know about it and you start checking for it in your physical examination, you find out how common problems with it are. Yeah, 100%. 
And you, for the listeners that haven't listened to our previous podcast, won't you do just a quick introduction about yourself and how you got involved in regenerative medicine? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I uh, work at Greenside Veterinary Practice, which is based in the Scottish Borders in the UK. And we are a regenerative medicine and rehabilitation referral centre. We was actually the, the first uh, centre of its kind in, in the UK to, to open to provide regenerative therapies to um, to the whole of the UK and uh, and parts of Europe as well. So I got into regenerative medicine about 10 years ago and uh, long story, but uh, to cut it short, it was my interest with laser therapy that got me interested in regenerative medicine. And then it was a chance uh, chance meeting with some cell biologists and uh, that was setting up a stem cell lab and I got involved in working with those and um, yeah the rest is history and now regenerative medicine is um, makes up 100% of my day and uh, and that's uh, that's that's all I do. So obviously we're going to dive into how you're using regenerative medicine um, to treat these iliopsoas cases. But before we do that, um, let's chat a little bit more about the condition, all right? We've already spoken about the fact that it is often undiagnosed and it's often missed. Um, what would be the clinical signs that would indicate that there's potentially something going on? And I, and I think you know, one of the problems with it is it's often in concurrent, it's concurrent with other conditions. And I think that's why it gets missed. So the main condition might be a cranial cruciate ligament injury or a hip dysplasia or a lumbar disc problem. Um, and so that's what gets diagnosed. And then we miss the iliopsoas. Yeah, for sure. The um, the iliopsoas can be a primary injury, and uh, and I think we see we see quite a lot of that because there's a real increase in agility dogs and, and working dogs, certainly um, that I see, and and it's quite common to get iliopsoas injuries uh, with those. But as you say, you know, I see it a lot in uh, pet pet animals as well. Um, and in those cases, it's normally a, a, a secondary condition associated with anything really that I, I think causes pelvic limb gait abnormalities or uh, particularly short striding. And in my mind, I, I think anything that uh, like hip dysplasia or hip arthritis, cruciate, uh, you get offloading of that limb, normally overloading of the uh, opposite limb and, and short striding. And I think the iliopsoas is a, is a hip flexor and, uh, and a adductor. So anything that changes the the way that the animal uses that 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 limb and specifically short striding i think that iliopsoas becomes shortened um over time because it's not being stretched out if you've got sore hips you're not going to uh, fully extend those hips and 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 once that muscle is is shortened then it predisposes it to uh, uh, repetitive strain type injuries and uh, also overloading you know, of the contralateral limb and things like that. We commonly see iliopsoas in in the other back leg, where the the primary problem is in in uh, in the other one. And I think that's yeah, again, repetitive strain from um, overloading and and overuse. So to um, you know, I think it's really important if we if we've got a, a, a pelvic limb lameness that we we evaluate, not all just the, the common things, you know, for cruciates and lumbar, lumbar sacral disease or, or lumbar disc disease, we need to, yeah, make sure that we evaluate all the soft tissue support structures. And really we need to incorporate that into our physical examination because the first stage of diagnosis is, is to, to pick up iliopsoas spasm or iliopsoas um, discomfort. And it can be really difficult to determine whether it is just muscle spasm or whether we have actually got a tendinopathy as well or an enthesiopathy where the tendon inserts. So the physical exam is the, the starting point. We can palpate the, the psoas muscle quite easily uh, in the abdomen on the roof of the abdomen, just where it attaches to the lateral spinous processes. And uh, if the dog's relaxed, we can get uh, quite a good feel of that and appreciate whether there's uh, 
hypertonicity or spasm or, or discomfort in, in that muscle. And, and then we can palpate uh, where the, the tendon arises and inserts on the lesser trochanter. So we can put pressure over the pectineus, which basically runs over the top of it um, and see if we've got discomfort um, there and uh, also performing the iliopsoas stretch test. So extending the, the hip fully and then abducting the hip. And we can even put a wee tweak on uh, of extra tension on that tendon by inwardly rotating the hock at the same time. And I think if we, we're finding any discomfort in the muscles or um, short striding or discomfort over the tendon insertion, then that warrants further investigation. And then normally what would you do? I mean, obviously ultrasound is probably the, the best best thing to do to be able to have a look, but would you do radiographs too? Uh, so I use a hell of a lot of musculoskeletal ultrasound, but as we've talked about, you know, there can be a lot of underlying conditions. So if we're going to treat the patient effectively. We need to identify all musculoskeletal pathology. So I think, yeah, survey radiographs of the hips for sure you know if you're getting pain on hip discomfort is that coming from the hip or is it coming from the iliopsoas stretch or is it even coming from lumbar sacral junction where you extend the hip and you start to flex the the sacrum and, and pinch that lumbar sacral junction so yeah survey radiographs are, are helpful looking at the lumbar spine and uh, and the hips uh, obviously, if you've got uh, stifle effusion or something pointing to potential cruciate disease, then um, uh, radiograph those. Same with the hocks. You know, if there's uh, arthritis, they are a reduced range of motion. Then we're going to look into into those areas. So, ultrasound is is the key modality, I think, for picking up iliopsoas. It's relatively cheap and minimally invasive. And, and I know some people do perform conscious ultrasound evaluations of the iliopsoas, but if it's sore, it's it's difficult. And to get the best views, you need the animal lying on their back with their uh, hips extended, and then you're um, ultrasounding into into the abdomen down through the pelvis to um, over the pectineus there. And if if there's pain there, they're not going to tolerate that, and you have mm -hmm. to put bit of pressure on your uh, probe to to get uh, the best images so uh, I always have them sedated for that um, or anesthetized if, if required you can use MRI obviously that would be a another modality to look at look at these but MRI is is really a, a 2D image of a static structure and ultrasound is 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 much better MRI you would need a uh, um, it's a lot more expensive. You need a general anaesthetic, and uh, and it just gives you a snapshot. Whereas musculoskeletal ultrasound, you can look at those structures dynamically um, in, in four dimensions. Really, you can get a three D view, and then we can observe them in time through motion. And uh, and yeah, it really is the modality of choice for, for these injuries. Sometimes on x-ray, if you've got real chronic um, iliopsoas uh, tendinopathy with mineralization of the enthesis or distal tendon, you'll see that you really want not quite a straight legged um, uh, x-ray. So if you, you, you can take like a hip dysplasia type x-ray, but then also putting the legs um, halfway between a straight legged and a, and a frog legged um, highlights that lesser trochanter quite nicely where the iliopsoas inserts. And sometimes you'll see some mineralization there, which will um, point you uh, in the right direction that we've got a problem. So if you don't have ultrasound, that's probably something that you could do if you're suspecting that it's chronic. Yes, for sure. Before we move on to the treatments, just want to go over um, like how the injury actually occurs. So let's chat about those agility dogs that you're talking about. So like, what are they actually doing um, that actually causes the injury to the iliopsoas muscle? So in these, these cases, it's normally a repetitive strain type injury. So anything that causes you know, a lot of extension of, of, of the hips or even um, 
um, abduction of the hip. So slips and things can, can certainly, uh, if the, the muscle's in a contracted state and they, they slip and um, splay their legs or, or you know, excessively ab ab abduct those those limbs so you know going through weaves and things like that and a frames um uh, are, are common um, sites of, of problems uh where where this can occur and yeah they may have not been appropriately warmed up or something like that that uh that can affect uh things as well but it's it's it, i think really it's um if there's a gait abnormality from uh, another condition that can adversely affect it but for for these primary tears it, it really needs um excessive hip abduction or or hip abduction um, sorry excessive hip abduction or extension with uh, with concurrent muscle contraction so it's normally um a, a fall or a, a slip or something like that that uh, can, can 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 cause that and is that similar for the ones that are second due to another condition? So if we think about our hip dysplasia cases, they'll have like really weak hind limbs and um, maybe they're on a slippery floor and they do exactly the same thing. They'll splay or slip and that's exactly how they're injuring the iliopsoas too. Yeah, I mean, they certainly can do that. But in, in those cases, there's there's been more of a degenerative process before that happens, I suspect, and and you're already seeing pathology in in those tendons, and then that uh, that slip can be you know final straw. Okay, so let's move on to the treatment now. Um, so what have you found to be the most effective um, in treating these iliopsoas muscle strains? So initially, when I first started treating them, we used a lot of laser therapy, and that's that's really helpful. And uh, and muscle relaxants. I use a lot of Rabaxin to to take away the muscle spasm because if you're trying to work with these uh, injuries and you've got a lot of spasm and pain and discomfort, you know you're not going to get very far with them. So uh, appropriate pain relief and and muscle relaxants on the drugs front, and then laser therapy is is uh, very helpful. Um, I've tried yeah therapeutic ultrasound on, on the tendons if we've got uh fibrosis scar tissue um in in those but what i found with sort of more conservative management is that we could get these under control but for uh, just a period of time and then we would see either repeat injury or just the flare up of, of the problem and uh, you'd sort of rehab them back to a stage maybe put them in hydrotherapy and then boom it's uh it's all in spasm and inflamed and painful again and i think yeah hydrotherapy uh is is you know so important in building muscle mass and things but it can um it can flare up iliopsoas very easily because you know these uh the iliopsoas muscle has got to flex the hip and if you put that uh, leg in in water and, and increase the resistance you're making that muscle and the tendon uh work a lot harder so Obviously, you know, my um, expertise is in regenerative medicine. So I started using stem cell therapy and platelet rich plasma in these cases. And um, I really saw, you know, massive improvements and, and, um, and cures and where we can actually reverse the fibrosis and scar tissue in the tendons um, and uh, resolve resume sort of normal fiber patterns and things like that because the stem cells have an amazing ability to remodel tissues to take away scar tissue and fibrosis and also produce new tissues new tendon fibers uh, and even with mineralization in the enthesis or tendons we can we can reverse that with regenerative medicine so what i was seeing once i started using that and re-evaluating the tendons with ultrasound sort of 12 weeks later we were seeing complete reversal of of the pathologies and uh, normal looking tendons and these dogs then um do really well and and they're they don't um um often you know recur uh unless there's you know a secondary problem that we're not addressing at the at the same time so I, I feel regenerative medicine is is definitely the answers for these and I, and I have yeah great success with them 
We... Wow. And where exactly would you be injecting? At the site of pathology. So if we're um, if we're looking with with ultrasound, that is the beauty of ultrasound. We can identify exactly where the lesions are, and uh, and then we can target those with um, with with stem cells and, and PRP. So. Uh, if we've got um, an enthesis issue uh, with uh, mineralization and things, I, I do tend to use um, shockwave in combination with the regenerative therapies for mineralized tissue. And uh, we would shockwave those and then uh, implant the stem cells under ultrasound guidance uh, into, into the enthesis and, and around the lesser trochanter. Uh, for the tendons, we can uh, inject... Um, well, the iliopsoas is, is uh, uh, two tendons combined. So we have uh, the iliacus component, and then we've got the psoas, and and they join and form a, a common tendon. So we need to identify which part uh, is is affected and, uh, and and target that, as I say. But we can uh, we can we can guide those treatments with ultrasound in between. The, the the conversion converging um, tendon fibers we can place it um, around the iliopsoas tendon itself in, into the sheath uh, obviously if we've got muscle injuries they tend not to require regenerative medicine uh, muscle heals very well on it on its own but I have seen a few cases where we've been left with uh, a lot of scar tissue in the muscle and uh, shortening of the muscle so we can target that with um, with the ultrasound again and identify and visualize those areas and, and inject the stem cells into into that area with the with the muscles it's not like injecting a joint where you know joint is a, a fibrous bag and you can fill that with stem cells and prp to treat arthritis with a with a tendon you know you're injecting into a, a, a solid uh, solid tissue so if there's a core lesion or something yeah you can inject small volumes into that um but you can also inject around the the, the tendon itself uh, and into into the muscle the muscle's more forgiving you can sort of um, infuse the muscle with uh, stem cells and PRP into, into the fibrous areas. If you're going up to the uh, psoas muscle where it attaches on the lateral spinous processes of the lumbar spine, that can be more difficult. There's some important structures um, overlying that. So again, um, uh, like your caudal vena cava, uh, major blood vessels so yeah, you have to be careful with uh, with injecting those areas but I would say most of my injections are into the the tendon or in thesis um, or the iliacus is a is a common um, area for you know, chronic muscle injury and, uh, and scar tissue and then how many injections are you doing so like like you'll do one and then do you do a repeat one um, a few weeks later so I do one injection of um, autologous mesenchymal cultured stem cells uh, in combination with platelet-rich plasma. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, that's um, a low white blood cell count, basically uh, eliminate uh, the white blood cells and it's just yeah, high and red blood cells and just high platelet count, normally sixfold times uh, normal blood concentration mixed in with uh, autologous stem cells. And then we would re-evaluate at 12 weeks after that. So we would ultrasound again. And if we saw any residual lesions, then we would treat again um, at that point, three months after. Tendons take a long time to heal naturally, uh, but also with regenerative medicine, it's not a, a quick fix. Uh, if we're treating arthritis and things, you know, we get a very potent anti-inflammatory effect in the first couple of weeks of injection into a joint. And we see that in tendons. Yeah, we can turn off that inflammatory process very quickly. But it, between about yeah three and six weeks is where we see a lot of remodeling. So that's where all the scar tissue is sort of taken away and, and, uh, and remodeled. And we're starting to get new tendon fibers. Um, and then it's really sort of up to 12, 12, 14 weeks is, is the time it takes to completely heal uh, following regenerative medicine. So 
we would reevaluate at, at 12 weeks and give a second treatment if required. And probably 30% of cases we're given a second treatment really depends what you're starting with. If you're starting with a, a real chronic case and uh, and the whole enthesis and, and uh, part of the insertion is mineralized, you're, you're probably going to need two treatments with that. Right. Yeah, sure. That's amazing. Have you got any interesting cases that you're currently treating that you could tell us about? I did have a, a, a very interesting case recently, and it was uh, a dog that had hip dysplasia. And, uh, and it went uh, for a hip replacement, it had bilateral hip dysplasia and, and arthritis, and they elected to treat the, the worst one. So they did a, a hip replacement and the replacement that they used was not the traditional one. It's a, a, a newer hip replacement that, um, so instead of cementing it into the, um, into the femur, they, they actually screw it. So there's three screws that go, go through the femur, whether you've seen um, any of these, but it was, uh, yeah, I think the first one that I'd, I'd seen using this, this technique. Anyway, so it had this hip replacement on one side and, uh, and the surgery went very well and the surgeon was very pleased with it, but the dog continued to have um, a, a lameness on, on that side and short striding and, uh, and, and wasn't using the leg particularly well. Uh, even I think it was yeah, about three months after, after the surgery, it was reevaluated by, by the surgeon and they took repeat x-rays and was like, yeah, everything's fine here. No implant issues. It's healed brilliantly. And, and the surgeon, uh, wasn't uh, concerned about the, the owner's reports of uh, uh, short striding and, and, and lameness. And they suggested that they do um, the same on the, on the other hip. And the owner was, was a bit concerned because she felt that the dog just wasn't quite right. So they came to us initially just for some hydrotherapy and some physiotherapy and rehab. And in our physios, uh, put the dog into hydrotherapy and it, it didn't go well. And uh, they came to me and said, you've got to have a look at this dog. I'm not happy with it. So I examined the dog and uh, touched its iliopsoas and the dog just hit the roof. It was like rock solid psoas muscle and in spasm. And there was uh, a lot of discomfort when I put pressure on the pectineus on that side. So we... We got the dog in for ultrasound and well, I did, I did x-ray the dog as well because I said, there must be an implant issue here mm. and uh, x-rayed it. Everything looked fine on x-ray. There was no implant issues, but one of the screws was just above the, the lesser trochanter and it was, it was coming out of the cortex of the bone. You could see the point of the screw just coming out the, the cortex a little bit. Um, but that's all you could see on x-ray. So I ultrasounded it and the tendon was just not happy. There was a lot of fibrosis and, um, and, and thickening and yeah, inflammatory change and just, it just looked a mess. And then all of a sudden, as I just fanned the probe round, boom, there's this screw and this screw was going right into the iliopsoas tendon. <laughs> Only by about two millimeters, but it was, yeah, it was um, obviously every time that hip was was flexed, it was putting tension on the on the tendon and just scraping it and and putting pressure on on this tip of the screw. And uh, so, yeah, we had our answer. So I was like, right, I'll send it back to the surgeon to remove that screw or reposition it. And uh, yeah, the dog went back. And uh, he said, I can't do that. I can't remove that screw without removing the whole uh, implant. And, uh, and I can't even, it was a special type of screw that's, that's threaded and you couldn't even just unscrew it a little bit to, to take the, the screw out. So he was like, it'll be fine. So the dog came back to me <laughs> and uh, yeah, the dog wasn't fine. So we had to think, well, if we can't remove the screw, what can we do? And uh, I didn't really want to cut the or transect the, the iliopsoas tendon. So I I can I can make with PRP a, a fibering clot. So we can 
artificially create a fibrin clot. And you can use, I use these sometimes for like wound management, if you've got a deep wound. Um, and I can make up a special PRP solution in and have two syringes, basically an activator, and then the, uh, the, the PRP. And when you combine those, it just instantly turns into um, a fibrin clot. Um, and these, you can put those in a Petri dish and, you know, peel it off and you've got a circular fibrin clot that you can use as a, a and they're incredibly tough. And uh, you can stitch that onto a wound to, um, to help the healing process and, and cover it. So I thought, what if I inject and make a fibrin clot over that tip of the screw and just lift that iliopsoas up and just fill it with fibrin. So we used ultrasound to guide um, our injection. I had two needles into the site of injury and the two syringes, the PRP and the activator, and uh, yeah, just injected those simultaneously. And it was beautiful on ultrasound. You could just see the tendon lift off the edge of ed, ed, um, the tip of the screw and it just formed this fibrin clot and then we put stem cells into the into the tendon and uh, and the dog did brilliantly we resolved all that damage to the the tendon that fibrin clot persisted and uh, and just put a little cushion over the screw head and uh, that was amazing and I think yeah without uh, without ultrasound we wouldn't have been able to get to that that diagnosis what a cool case uh, did yeah. you tell the surgeon what you did yes yeah he um, must have been like oh okay he must have been <laughs> feeling a little bit small because he was like there's nothing we can do and there you came up yeah. with like a novel idea i mean he would never have thought of that right i mean i felt sorry for him because i the 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 owner was unhappy but the surgery that he'd done wasn't wrong. I mean, you know, there was yeah. no, uh, there was no problem with it, and he didn't have any choice with that screw position. And yeah. uh, you know, the hip replacement was successful. It's just unfortunate we had this um, unlucky. Yeah. So the surgeon was lucky that you were around <laughs> to come up with that idea. <laughs> yeah. What an awesome case. Yeah. Um, I've got another question for you, Andrew. Those cases that go through those 12 weeks, what type of rehab are you doing with them through that 12-week period after they've had the PRP and stem cells? I, I, I don't tend to rehab them very much until I've done the repeat ultrasound at 12 weeks. So initially, it is a restricted exercise, but not too much. So we start for the first couple of weeks, sort of 10 minutes, three, four times a day. And then we would build that exercise up by 10 minutes each walk each week and um, and keep them on the lead for at least six weeks. And in that time, at six weeks, we're doing laser therapy on the uh, on the on the muscle and the tendon and uh, and using muscle relaxants uh, and pain medication as required. Because as I said earlier, for the first thing that needs to happen is well tendons have a very poor blood supply so we need to grow a new blood supply into that area so the prp and the stem cells stimulate angiogenesis new blood supply so that's that's first of all we get anti-inflammatory effect then we need to grow in new blood supply and then we need to remove the the scar tissue or mineralization that all takes time six eight weeks minimum to take away the bad stuff and grow in a, a good blood supply to help uh, regenerate and restore the tissues. So in that first six weeks, it is just laser therapy. I don't do any um, any physical therapies at all. Um, I just let the stem cells and the PRP do their magic. Because if you're getting, if you've got a lot of scar tissue and you start um, removing that, and then you start excessively stretching and things like that. That's where it can can go wrong, and you can get you know acute inflammation and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I do very little, and then it's it's really depends what I find at uh, at six weeks. I check them six weeks later, and uh, at that point we can start um, we can start doing some um, some more. Um, advanced you know exercises but we're just cautious the whole time 
and I'm probably more cautious than I should be, what I like to do is at 12 weeks, ultrasound the tendon, be like, right, it's good. We can then rack it up. And then very quickly, if we've got normal linear fiber pattern, um, I would I would really rack up the, the physical therapy and, and get them into hydrotherapy quite quickly after that um, to uh, to help yeah with range of motion start stretching those those areas out but initially just laser and then uh, we can start um, adding in stretches and things if if the animal's comfortable um, at about six to eight weeks after treatment. Awesome, Andy. Thank you so much um, for coming again to chat to me about how you use regenerative medicine in your practice. I must say, every time I chat to you, I'm just like, oh, wow, wow, wow. And um, yeah, I just, I, I wish that we had somebody like you in my area because I don't. Um, I remember last time we chatted and, you know, yeah. I've so been wanting to find somebody to do regenerative medicine on my 12 year old. She's like a mixed breed dog. She's got elbow problems and she's got hip problems and I just want to find an Andrew in Cape Town but there isn't <laughs> one so I have found somebody in Johannesburg it's like a 14 hour drive yeah. and so my family and I have been chatting about making the drive up with her um, and just getting it done so yeah and hopefully the next time we chat I can be chatting to you about um, the experience that I've had and how um, my dog Sunshine has um, responded to the treatment yeah that'd be brilliant well, yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great. No problem at all. Thank you. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit on Saturday, the 31st of August, 2024. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continuing education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.